Hello everyone and welcome to the first real chapter-based lecture of the semester. We are starting out with chapter one, Introduction to Environmental Science, and the purpose of this chapter is to give you sort of a broad overview of some of the concepts and ideas that we'll be covering over the course of the semester. In this lecture we'll be covering a lot of ground but in a relatively shallow depth, and much of what we look at in this lecture will be revisited in greater detail as we move through our future chapters. So our goals for this introductory look at environmental science are the following. We are going to talk about what the environment is, what an ecosystem is, and what environmental science is as a scientific discipline. We will also discuss why it is important to study environmental science. Um, what good does it do to learn about the subject? We will look at the concept of sustainability and the challenges that we face in pursuing sustainability, including social, political, and cultural challenges. We will introduce the relationship between humans and the environment, including the way that humans impact nature. And in this realm, there are competing ideas about how decisions should be made about the environment, including two philosophies called the proactionary principle and precautionary principle. So we will look at those and we'll also look at how we as humans justify the different ways that we interact with the environment. And this will lead us into a conversation about ethics. So what is the right way for humans to interact with the environment? And also about environmental justice. What is the fair way for humans to interact with the environment? And finally, we also want to understand the scientific basis for the knowledge that we learn in environmental science. So we'll look at the process of scientific inquiry, or in other words, how science is done. We'll compare different types of scientific reasoning, and we will distinguish between the goals and processes of basic science and applied science. So that is our roadmap for this first chapter. Let's get started by diving into um, what is really the most basic question as to what this course is about. What is environmental science? So environmental science is the study of the interaction of living and non-living things in the environment. The subject looks at the processes, the cycles, and the patterns that we see in the environment, which encompass both living things and non-living things. And because of this, um, the field is dynamic because the reality is that every day we are learning more and more about how those processes work. And so the field is constantly progressing. And also because of this, um, environmental science is an interdisciplinary subject. And what that means is that it takes pieces from many different sciences, including biology, chemistry, geology, um, climatology, and more. And environmental science doesn't just study living and non-living things separately. It also studies the interaction between them. And one very important interaction that has become more and more the focus of environmental science is the effect that humans are having on the environment, um, which is something that we will look at in detail in this class. So given that environmental science straddles the living and non-living natural worlds, it's important that we understand the difference between what is considered alive and what's considered not alive. There are generally eight characteristics that, when taken together, distinguish something as being alive. And if you have all of these characteristics, then you are a living thing. But if you're missing even one of them, then you are not. So what are those characteristics? They are, firstly, sensitivity or response to stimuli, meaning that organisms, living things, respond to signals from the environment, such as, for example, um, a sunflower tracking the movement of the sun. Secondly, growth and development, meaning that living things grow and mature, and as they do, they develop the traits that are genetically encoded in their DNA. Third is reproduction. Living things also reproduce, which means they create more offspring of their own kind. Here we see this process occurring um, rather rapidly among a population of bacteria under the microscope. Also adaptation, living organisms are capable of adaptation, meaning that 
Over generations, they evolve traits and characteristics that make them better able to survive in their environment, such as, for example, the white fur coat of an Arctic fox, which provides it with camouflage. Living things also exhibit self-regulation, meaning that they have these complex mechanisms for regulating their functions. This shows here on the slide a paramecium, um, which is demonstrating its ability to self-regulate using a structure called a contractile vacuole to expel excess water from the cell. You can see that going on sort of in the lower middle part of its body, um, or rather its cell, it's a single-celled organism, and thereby it regulates its water content. Closely tied to regulation is homeostasis, which is defined as the ability of an organism to maintain stable internal conditions. This can include the pH of bodily fluids. It can include body temperature, for example. Um, when you sweat, that is a way for your body to maintain homeostasis by secreting water that will evaporate and cool you. Living things also process energy. They get energy from sources in their environment and then convert it into useful forms as needed to support all of their functions. Plants, for example, obtain their energy through a process called photosynthesis, which we will talk about in more detail later, where they capture the energy of sunlight and transform it into energy-rich chemical compounds. And lastly, living things have order. They have a highly organized structure that has some uniform features across all living things. For example, all living things are made of cells, which is the basic unit that makes them up. Here you can see plant cells under the microscope, but animals, fungi, bacteria, any living organism you can think of is also made of cells. And this idea of the organization of living things transitions us nicely into our next topic, which is levels of organization within and among living organisms. So we said all living things are made of cells, and in some organisms it stops there because some organisms are made of just a single cell, like bacteria, or like that paramecium that we saw a few slides back. However, in larger multicellular organisms, cells are organized into tissues. For example, human skin tissue or human muscle tissue is an example of this. Then tissues are organized into organs and organ systems, like the nervous system or the respiratory system, and those organs are found nested within the organism. So the organism is the individual entity. For example, this wildebeest here is an organism. When you get many individuals of the same species together in the same habitat, this is referred to as a population. Species also generally live alongside other species, not in isolation, and so the association of different populations uh, in a particular area is called the community. So in this image, for example, we see uh, populations of wildebeest and zebra and ostriches and even a giraffe that are all associated with each other. Um, now, cells, organisms, populations, communities, all of these pertain exclusively to living things or collections of living things. So where does the non-living stuff come in? Because we know that environmental science looks at both living and non-living things together. So this is a concept called an ecosystem. An ecosystem is defined as the community of organisms living in an area plus the non-living environmental components like the local climate, the geographic features of the landscape like rivers or mountains, the nutrients in the soil, etc. So ecosystems can be very large, but they can also be very small. An entire forest is considered an ecosystem, but also a puddle of water that accumulates in your backyard and a mosquito comes along and lays their eggs and spawns in it. That is also an ecosystem on a smaller scale. The broadest, most encompassing level of organization is the biosphere. The biosphere is synonymous with Earth itself. It includes all of the ecosystems on Earth, all of the land, all of the water, uh, all the things that live on and in it, and even parts of the atmosphere. 
But tackling the whole biosphere is a bit of a handful. So let's take one step back down those levels of organization and focus on just ecosystems instead. The range of ecosystems on Earth is extremely diverse, and what life looks like in a particular ecosystem depends upon several factors. These include how much light a habitat gets from the sun, what kind of nutrients are present in the soil, how much organic matter is there for consumption and what type. Um, another factor that defines the characteristics of the ecosystem is its latitude, or in other words, its distance away from the equator. Also, the amount of rainfall that an ecosystem experiences, its elevation or topography, meaning the way that the geography of the land is laid out and how elevated it is. And finally, the biodiversity, how many different species share the habitat, which can range from just a few species to thousands. As you can imagine, depending upon these characteristics, different ecosystems will look quite different from each other. But there are three very broad categories into which all ecosystems can be sorted. Um, and those are marine, or in other words, ocean ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems, and terrestrial, or in other words, land-based ecosystems. Marine ecosystems are the most common since three quarters of the Earth's surface uh, is occupied by ocean. Some specific examples of marine ecosystems are coral reefs, mangrove forests, and deep sea ocean environments. So each of these examples is marine in nature, but it exhibits distinct characteristics and its levels of biodiversity, the topography, competition for resources among the resident species, etc. A very important resident of marine ecosystems that are found near the ocean surface are phytoplankton which are tiny microscopic organisms that perform photosynthesis. Uh, you may associate photosynthesis primarily with land plants, but these guys do it too. And they're actually responsible for a huge contribution to the overall amount of photosynthesis that's happening on the planet. They conduct 40% of the photosynthesis that takes place on Earth, and therefore they play a major role in cycling oxygen in the atmosphere. A much smaller percentage of the biosphere is composed of freshwater ecosystems, approximately 1.8% of the Earth's surface. And this includes freshwater lakes, rivers, streams. Um, these are far less abundant than bodies of salt water, but most freshwater ecosystems are very diverse and just teeming with life. Terrestrial ecosystems, the ones that are based on land and make up the remaining percentage of the Earth's surface, um, they also tend to be highly diverse. And because of that diversity, one approach that environmental scientists use to simplify the complexity in terrestrial ecosystems is to divide them up into categories called biomes. And many of these biomes you've probably heard of before. Um, for example, the desert is one biome that's characterized primarily by low levels of rainfall and low levels of available water. Many of these biomes are located at a latitude about 30 degrees either north or south of the equator. Grassland is another biome defined by having a flat topography that's covered in grasses and minimal trees. And then the tropical rainforest biome consists of regions located at a latitude that's near the equator that are hot and they experience high levels of rainfall and generally very high levels of biodiversity. Um, one word of caution about biomes. While the tendency to sort ecosystems into biomes can be useful, it can also be problematic because it can sometimes lead to oversimplification of our understanding of an ecosystem. So for example, the Sonoran Desert where we live belongs in the desert biome category, um, but so does the island of Socotra off the coast of Yemen, which is pictured on the right. And in terms of the range of species that live there, these two environments, both deserts, could not be more different. So keep in mind that not all ecosystems classified within a given biome are the same.